before I start and I launch into whatever we're going to talk about today, <laughs> I just want to say from the bottom of my heart that I love you. I love you. Well, thank you. Well, thanks. <laughs> love you, Megs. Um, and so I want to start with that because I know the last time that I gave kind of a preface to what I was about to teach was like I punted it. And I was like, everybody's like, that wasn't so complicated. I wasn't offended. Today I might do it. And so I just, before we launch into it, I just want you to know that I love you. And that everything that I say today, uh, it comes from a place of love, um, not, not anywhere else. And so with that, let's go ahead and launch in. Today we are continuing in our series titled Jesus People. And the big thrust of our series has been to explore discipleship as it relates to what the 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 disciples <laughs> experienced in, I can't talk today, what they experienced uh, through Matthew chapters 8 through 12. Because starting in chapter 13, which we won't be there for a while, but once we get to 13, there's going to be a big hard shift in, in the book of Matthew again. Um, and so just as a, a way of reminding us where we've been through to catch us up, our first week, we talked about the cost of discipleship or the cost of following Jesus with everything we've got, that following Jesus actually challenges our comfort and our convention to embody his way. That means that it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be, uh, it's not always going to feel good, and it's not always going to maybe fit within the box that I create for God to fit into, it might be beyond that and stretch me to that point beyond that. Second week, we talked about <clears throat> the call of discipleship, how Christ's call communicates compassionate character and how Jesus, he just, he loves to ruffle our feathers a bit because he calls us, which from a personal note, that's a good thing. I love the fact that Jesus chose me, but there are some people in the world that I look at and I think, Really, Jesus, you want them to be in your kingdom too? Ah, come on, really? And so, but really that's that heart of love that Jesus has for people that he even calls the folks that we couldn't even imagine that they would be in the kingdom. And isn't it a good thing that he called you and you're probably that person for somebody else? <laughs> Amen? And so <laughs> with that, our third week, we talked about contending in our faith, what it means to contend. And we, uh, somebody had approached Jesus about the practice of, uh, of fasting and how there are certain spiritual practices that we participate in by the Holy Spirit's leading. It's not just us doing it because we want to do it and uh, we're really going to white knuckle our way through it. It's because the Holy Spirit leads us to that place, to that point of saying, okay, I'm going to do this thing. It doesn't make sense to me, but okay. So like fasting, I don't like giving up food. I don't know about you all. Um, but um, the point of all of that in that week was that we express heaven, God's kingdom come to earth, heaven, when we follow the Holy Spirit's leading. Our fourth week, that was last week, we talked about the idea of carrying or carrying our faith as disciples. And so the big idea from last week was that Jesus empowers his disciples to carry his kingdom mandate and authority. That is, that Jesus has a mission, and he doesn't just send us out like sheep among wolves uh, without a big baseball bat, so to speak, called the Holy Spirit. Basically, he empowers us for life and godliness, and he empowers us for ministry. And the cool thing at least within the Gospels, is that in Matthew, it, Jesus is sending them out to do some pretty far out stuff. That like, if we were to actually sit down and have a conversation, some of us might not believe that that's possible. That you could pray for somebody who is dead and they could be raised to life again. 
that you could pray for somebody who was sick, that you could join in prayer with other people and just by laying hands on them and praying for them that they could be healed of whatever infirmity that they have. That whatever you do, I'm, I'm, I'm getting on my preaching thing again on that one, that whatever you do, whether that's giving somebody a cool glass of water on a hot day, or maybe it's volunteering at the, the pregnancy and parenting center or down at SOS or, or any number of places here in town where we can share God's love with people, Jesus empowers us to do that by his Holy Spirit. And that is good news because we don't have to do it in our own strength. We don't even have to do it in our own attitude because sometimes, I don't know about you, but I have a stinky attitude sometimes and I get cranky and I don't want to do it. But the Holy Spirit, he, he, sometimes he doesn't let it go. And so you have a conversation between you and the Lord in that moment, right? Now that all leads us to today. It's a weird, weird chapter and it's a weird moment. And so we're going to get through it together. Uh, Richard, you can go to the next slide. The title for today is Crowds and Cynics. It's weird to talk about discipleship in that, but the title is Crowds and Cynics, and the passage is going to be Matthew 11, 1 through 24. And the big idea that we're going to be exploring together today is that evidence of God's kingdom is showing today. Are you paying attention? Evidence of God's kingdom is showing today. Are you paying attention? You can go to the next slide. So I, I don't like to get on different campaigns and things because that often causes division. Um, once upon a time when I was leading another church, I, I mentioned another movement in something and somebody didn't like it. And so they decided to leave my church over it. So I don't do this lightly. Uh, but I, I use it as a most recent example because I think that it, uh, it's very poignant for what we're about to talk about. So there's this ad campaign. If any of you watched the Super Bowl, a number of hands went up, okay. Uh, some of you may have just heard in the news because you watched the news um, that there was this ad campaign. It only happened twice in the whole Super Bowl. That costs a lot of money for those 30 second increments. <laughs> um, but there's this nonprofit organization called He Gets Us. And the whole thrust behind it is to introduce people to Jesus. These are people, uh, the people who run it and the, you know, the main message of it is a gospel-centered, biblical-based picture of Jesus. They contextualize it in a way so that people can interact with it who may never crack the spine of a Bible and may never turn to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or may never even darken our doorstep here because they're afraid God might smite them. But the point of this whole ad campaign was that Jesus is someone who wants to relate with you because he gets where you're at. What is fascinating to me is that there are at least two camps of people who, who, who uh, uh, were created after those commercials um, aired. There was the vast majority. I mean, the polls came in and the vast majority of people, most of which I would probably submit to you, don't go to church, don't believe in Jesus, don't want anything to do with religion, and yet they had a positive impact from those commercials. Right? Then, but then there's the other folks. Um, there, so uh, among whom, uh, where they kind of cast a cynical eye on it. And I'm going to use that word because even though there's probably better w words to use, um, there's a certain politician, I'm not going to use their name because I don't think that's fair and I don't want to get political. That's one of my things, I don't get political. But there was a politician, you can look it up later, um, who came out saying, 
how horrendous it was that they spent all this money on these ad campaigns when they could have given that money to the poor. And then I had a, a dear friend from college, uh, it was actually Angie's college, but uh, who posted, if you're complaining about uh, people wasting money uh, to get people to know Jesus, you might be Judas. <laughs> and I was like, whew, that's cutthroat. Um, <laughs> A little bit. Um, however, so here's what I want to say. As we introduce this idea of crowds versus cynics, and I'm, I'm sure there's like a middle of the road approach where there's people where it's like they understand what they were trying to do, but they still don't like it. But so, and there may be people in this room where that's where you feel and that's okay. Now, however, What's fascinating is that there is a whole group of people, we might label them the crowd, where they're exposed to this Jesus that they may not know a whole lot about, but they have a, a positive disposition towards Jesus because of this. And then there are the folks on the two extremes. There's the folks who, they get really angry about this and they don't like it. And in Jesus' day, in this moment of, of Matthew chapter 11, there are these people who are around everywhere Jesus goes. Mostly it's the crowd, but even inside the crowd, there's a certain portion of the crowd where they're just really mad at everything that Jesus does, even the good, crazy things that you and I would look at it and we'd say, this is amazing. <laughs> and yet they just still get up in arms about it. And so I, I've labeled it as crowd and cynics because I think that to just call that group of the cynics any other, you know, just the enemy or, or whatever, I don't think that's fair to them because I think that in a very real way, there are people who would be in that category where they have a genuine love for the Lord. They just might be... Um, they might be just in a place of misunderstanding where they don't get it and their eyes haven't been opened yet. Or maybe they're just in a place where they're completely closed off and they're not able to receive whatever it is Jesus is trying to show them versus the crowd where anything goes. <laughs> and, um, and they're just excited to be there and they're excited that Jesus is there and we have these two extremes. And I would submit to you that as disciples of Jesus, as people who, who love him, who follow after him, there is something to be gleaned by looking at both groups and this certain interaction that happens in Matthew 11. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew 11. Matthew 11, beginning in verse 1. If you want to follow along on the screen, you're welcome to do so. Just as a, a point of noting that... Uh, on the slide, something that I've taken to doing is that if Jesus is speaking, I put those words in red. Um, that is something that uh, is consistent with many of the Bibles that you would, uh, you would get at a bookstore or that kind of thing. So Matthew 11, beginning in verse 1. Here we go. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, so remember he, he had been instructing them saying, watch out, this is what's going to happen, I'm sending you out. He was teaching them, and then he sent them out. Here we go. After he finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, this is John the Baptist, by the way, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. 
As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd. There's that crowd. About John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, I love that, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. <clears throat> For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others, we played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. <laughs> the Son of Man, that is Jesus, came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Pethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to hell. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. Woo! Wow! cutthroat. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Wow. Wow. Okay. Let's unpack this a little bit. So there are three observations I have. Number one is I see here an experiencing evidence of God's kingdom breaking in. So John the Baptist, he's in prison. He hears news about what the Messiah is doing. There's a buzz happening. And so even though he's in prison, he gets visitors. And so he sends his disciples to Jesus and asks him, are you actually the one? I know I, I baptized you, and I saw the Spirit descend like a dove, and I know that, you know, there was that sign confirmation, but are you really the one? Isn't that amazing? And so then Jesus' response was to these disciples of John, go and report what you hear and what you see. You can go to the next slide. It's fascinating. So Jesus gives this list. He says, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. That's quite a list, folks. Now, what's fascinating is that that actually matches up with some prophecies about the Messiah, some foretellings that God had sent a messenger to God's people to say, say this to my people. And 
there were these prophecies that were told to the people about the coming Messiah when God was going to send this deliverer who was going to set everything right. And here's what it has to say. So in Isaiah 35, here's the most poignant. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then uh, will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. And so that's talking about the time when that takes place. Another one in Isaiah 26, 19, it says, but your dead will live. That's fascinating. Lord, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Foreshadowing that foretelling of resurrection or that raising from the dead. Now, Isaiah 29, 19 says, once more the humble will rejoice in the Lord, the needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. And Isaiah 61, verse 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. Isn't that interesting? How Jesus, instead of giving a clear poignant yes. <laughs> Instead, he is pointing to the fruit of his ministry. He's saying, you experience it. You can see for yourself. There's that blind man over there. He couldn't see a half hour ago, but I laid hands on him and I prayed for him, and the Holy Spirit healed him. That guy over there, he's, he's jumping up and down because, well, he's been following me for a while, but I I prayed for him, and he is now walking even though he couldn't walk before. These are the kinds of things that happened, and Jesus could point and say, look at this person. Look with your eyes. Here's this person. Here's this person whose story has now been impacted by the kingdom, and they have a testimony. Go to them. Ask them what, what has happened for them. <clears throat> what they've experienced. You can go to the next slide. This reminds me, so the instructions basically from Jesus was experience it, witness it, and then go report. This reminds me, I can't say the name correct, Phaeopides. Uh There was this runner in the ancient world uh, who was, uh, he was a messenger. They had runners in ancient Greece. And what they would do um, is that uh, they would send the runner with a message and they would run and deliver that message and then they'd run back. These guys were like top shape. Anyway, poor Phaeopides, uh, at the very end of this war between Athens and Persia, uh, Athens actually won and so he ran 26 miles from the battlefield. That's how the legend goes to Athens and at the end of that in one straight shot, he gives his report, and then he dies. <laughs> and that's where we get uh, the marathon run from. Uh, it's not because people have a death wish. It's because there was this great feat that somebody did uh, to run that great distance in one fell swoop. Now, why do I use this as an example? It makes me think of this because Phaeopides, he saw the victory he saw with his own eyes that Athens won. So now he's got to go tell everybody, you won't believe it. This war that's been going on, we actually did it, we won. Now, in relation to where we're at in Matthew, for John's disciples, they've been slugging it out, doing ministry, fasting a whole bunch because that's what they did. Uh, that was one of the things they had an issue with as disciples from John, because uh, as the text said, uh, John uh, didn't eat anything, <laughs> uh, and people that said he had a demon. <laughs> and, um, but so John's disciples, Jesus says, look with your eyes, see for yourself, victory has happened for these people. They have overcome because of what God is doing now, today. That's fascinating. And so 
there's this witness in this report. And so how that might apply for you and I is that there is a directive here for them and also for us by extension to go and share what you have experienced from the Lord, to testify to what God has been doing in your life. Um, if we were to take the time, we're not going to today, don't worry, <laughs> at least today, uh, where if we were to go around and we were to just share stories, this is what God's doing in my life. This is how God is showing up. This is what's happening. We'd be here for hours, partially because we have so many people, but then also because just the depth of things, like just even if we just shared one story from the last week, I'm sure it would take a while. But beyond that, our stories are impacted by our Lord. And He gets the glory from that. And so, evidence of God's kingdom is showing today. That's my claim to you. I think there's stuff happening today that is evidence that God is on the move. God is doing something new today that may be different than yesterday. And so my question to you is, are you paying attention? So my second observation is this. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> there's a reflecting on pursuit repentance and receiving. I didn't know how to like sum all this up in, in these seven or eight verses here. <clears throat> but so Jesus, he, the text says, then he turned and addressed the crowd. So John's disciples come up to him. He's just doing ministry, doing his thing. And so then, but then he turns to the whole big crowd who's there and he asks them a couple of different fun questions so the first being, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? He was talking about John the Baptist. And then, I love it, Jesus pops some jokes here, guys. I don't know if you caught on to it in the way I was inflecting my voice or not. But so the first thing he says is, a reed swayed by the wind? The obvious answer is no. John was a pretty strong character. But then I love it because then he says, a man dressed in fine clothes, this is the joke. Because we know in Matthew chapter 3, if we were to go back and look at it, that Matthew 3 describes John, his, his main uniform that he wore was a tunic made of camel's hair and a leather belt. And that was it. Not comfortable, <laughs> not something I would ever want to buy or make or anything, but yet he did. And so that's great for him. But What's interesting is, so at this point, I'm sure John's disciples and the people who had seen John, I'm sure they chuckled at that. I imagine it. It's not in the text, but I imagine a laugh arose because Jesus was kind of, because John was his cousin, he was kind of poking fun like we do with family, right? But then he asked this question, a prophet? Did you go out to see a prophet? It's almost like uh, green eggs and ham. Will you? <laughs> Will you? Could you? Um, did you go out to see a prophet? And then Jesus, he's finally making it absolutely clear. He says, yes and more. It's fascinating. You can go to the next slide. So uh, actually two slides from now. Go ahead. Advance. So there's kind of an artist's rendering of John and the crowds who went out to see him. You can go to the next slide even. So there is this moment in Malachi chapter 3. That's the last uh, minor prophet in the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, and God is saying through Malachi, he says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And so Jesus characterized what Matthew already said, even from a prophecy from Isaiah, that John's purpose was to prepare the way. 
And then he goes and he describes his ministry and John's ministry and the contrast between the two. Jesus is feasting, John is fasting, and both are proclaiming the kingdom. And then he asks this beautiful question. No, it's not even a question, but the implication is a question. He says, he who has ears, let him hear. And that was a a colloquial saying for basically saying, are you paying attention? Coaxing and challenging saying, pay attention, listen up, this is important for you to hear. And this reminds me of when I was a student in Bible college uh, for a year and a half, um, right before Maggie was born. Um, And uh, like all good college students, I had my laptop on. <laughs> I was listening to, and the rule at the Bible college was you were not supposed to surf the internet. You're not supposed to do all this different stuff. But yet, all the people are on Facebook. All the people are checking their things and distracted. And the whole purpose of the rule and all the purpose of what Uh, the different rules that my Bible college had set into place was that they really believed that what they were teaching us was an impartation from the Lord to us for us to understand God better. And that we were there to learn, and so therefore we needed to be in a place of receiving whatever it was we were being taught. But then there's that tug of, oh, my laptop's open, I should check Facebook. Oh, I should check uh, MSN Messenger <laughs> because Angie might have message, messaged me. Um, or, or fill in the blank thing. And we all do this, even if we were sitting at home, you were over at my house, and, or maybe we went out to coffee or something, and I had my laptop open, it'd be really hard not to just like quickly check some, something on there, or like check the news, or... Uh, if there was a game on or something like like could be happening right now, you could check your phone and say, ah, what's the score on the game? <laughs> or what's the score of that golfer or whatever? I digress. But the point is that there's this place of distraction in the place of impartation. When something is happening that you're supposed to be receiving and God's revealing himself to you, and sometimes we get distracted. And so... Reflecting on that pursuit, why did we even go out there in the first place? Reflecting on the why, and then posing the challenge of, are you paying attention? I think that's what God is asking us today, because evidence of God's kingdom is showing today, and the really big question at the heart of our passage is, are you paying attention to what he's doing? Are you even open to it? And that leads us to our final thought. You can go to the next slide, is the thing I see in the passage is witnessing and the judgment for closedness. I didn't know how to quite find the right word, but I think that fits pretty well, even though it's a made-up word. <laughs> so, witnessing and the judgment for closedness. So, he, just, he, so he addresses the crowd, but then he shifts and then he starts talking about these cities that he's gone and, and performed these different miracles in, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And Capernaum at that point was his hometown because he had moved there. So, like, he had been doing ministry in these three towns, and then he basically says that, how can I describe you, this generation? And he, he uses this phrase, um, you know, we played a song for you, you didn't dance, we sang a dirge, you didn't mourn. Basically, we offered you engagement, but you didn't respond. You were unresponsive, you were closed off. And then he launches in and he says, you know, it's going to be better off for these wicked cities of ancient antiquity, like Sidon and Tyre, and Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to be better for those who experience the very real, tangible wrath of God. You can go to the next slide. Uh, There's a picture of that where we see that's an artistic rendering of Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. And what's interesting is that God 
poured out his wrath on these cities, and he's basically saying it'd be better for them than on for you for the final day of judgment because had the miracles that were being performed to them right there, Jesus in the flesh, I can go up and give him a hug and say, thank you for healing somebody, you know, whatever. I can go up and touch the real physical Jesus. I can go there, but they didn't repent. They weren't even paying attention. They were being closed off and maybe even, for some of them, cynical towards Jesus. And Jesus suggests that wisdom is known by her deeds. I've heard wisdom described as the application of knowledge. And so if we were to know that God works in a certain way, and there are even people in the gospels who are reasoning in this way, if God works this certain way, and Jesus is doing this stuff over here, that means the kingdom is here. Even Jesus saying to the disciples of John, hear and see, the blind see the lame walk, etc., etc. He's basically saying, look at the deeds for yourself. And there are people who are just not open to that witness. They say, no, thank you. I'm good. I'm, I'm not going to repent. That doesn't affect me in any way. Maybe Jesus healed that person's sister, but he didn't heal mine. And so there, that's where that cynicism idea kind of creeps in a little bit. And then Jesus offers judgment to them. And I know that in today's world, we don't like the word judgment. Uh, There might be some of you who like it, but the the place, and by and large, most places don't like the word judgment. And in Scripture, really all it means is, like the purest sense of the word is that God judges rightly what is true. He sees things as it is, and he sings, sees things as, as they are and, and says them as such. So he looks at these towns, and he says, these miracles would have been performed and people would have repented, but you didn't. Woe to you, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and um, Capernaum. You can go to the next slide. This makes me think of the phrase, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Because if you look at that guy, he's kind of an older guy, he's got some salt and pepper. There's not really much of a way to get to him, is there? And I know that that's the phrase, hear no evil. But then, like, if you're completely closed off, and your eyes are completely closed, and your ears are completely stopped up, and there's no way for you to receive any kind of input, that's pretty closed off. And I think Jesus is saying, see. Here. Testify to what I'm doing. You can go to the next slide. And so, as an application... I just want to submit to you that the question, how receptive are we to God working in the here and now? Because evidence of God's kingdom is showing today. Are you paying attention? You know, uh, kingdom advancing ministry, it's continuing in and through the church today, whether you agree with that church or not, on theological points isn't the issue. Are they actually advancing the kingdom or not? And do you see it as such? And I'm not saying that theology should be thrown out the window. Don't misunderstand me. I believe that a right theology and a right doctrine is good. But is the kingdom being advanced? Is God's love being shared with people? Yes or no? And are you willing to label it and judge it as true, even if you might disagree with it. Now, fascinating point. Kingdom advancing ministry, it's changing lives in the here and now, today. Are we being cynical towards it? 
Maybe because we experienced something and then real life kicked in and we're like, yeah, but, you know, life goes on. Or maybe uh, there were some people who were uh, in throughout all of Christendom were criticizing what's going on or what went on at Asbury Seminary at that big uh, awakening outpouring, whatever label you want to put to it. But there were people who were like, yeah, but it's not. Here are r- real markers of revival. This, not so much. Cynical. Yet God's clearly doing something among these young people. And yet there are people who are, they got this axe to grind because maybe for them, maybe they experienced a revival for themselves and maybe they went to that event, they went to that thing and they experienced God's love for themselves, but then real life kicks in and the cares of this world kind of stole it away. Are we being cynical towards those things? Third and final observation of application is kingdom advancing ministry is happening are we participating in it? Or are we partnering with what God's doing? Or do we cast judgment on it because it doesn't fit into our view of God? And so my ultimate question for you today is that if, if the statement is true, and I believe it is, that evidence today is happening, that God's kingdom is happening, it's here, it's now, we can experience it today in part. I know there's going to be a a final fulfillment when Jesus returns, but evidence is happening today. What are you going to do about it? And, And Jesus uses the two extremes. Well, Matthew uses the two extremes, but, uh, Jesus addresses the two extremes of the crowd and the cynics. And then you and I are caught in the middle. And we're, we're tasked with, okay, so what are we going to do with this information? Now that we've received this, what are we going to do with it? Let's pray.